Hello and welcome to this assignment walkthrough video for the DHIS2 curriculum developed by Logical Outcomes. My name is Nicholas Santillo and in this video I'm joined by Sarah Godin and together we go through the requirements questionnaire that Sarah actually helped develop along with HISP Uganda. And she's going to walk me through how to answer these questions and how to think about them when filling it out. Okay, uh, so I'm here with Sarah. Hi Sarah. Hello, Nicholas. Hey, and uh, you're going to be leading us through just the implementation requirements questionnaire. So explaining kind of uh, outlining the questions, uh, giving us a better understanding so that uh, we can actually answer these questions. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> so in our curriculum notebook um, near the beginning, planning an effective m &E system, we've got the questionnaire as a page and then it's also a Word document. So if you want to have this discussion with your team, just share the Word doc if that's easy for you or you can use it to take notes as well. Um, so the questionnaire is in a few different sections and it's kind of in the order that you'd want to configure your system, which is nice. Mm -hmm. So the first question is all about where you're collecting data from. Okay, so you'd have to define, you know, we're collecting data at a country level, a region and district, and then actually naming those, those areas. So this is where you'll want to start collecting um, on an Excel sheet, your different mm -hmm. levels, or you could use the assignments um, that Nicholas has laid out here and just collect it um, in the notebook itself. Right. So something um, that's important is if your organization uses codes to identify your sites and you want to include those in DHIS2, um, collect those. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also an important piece about GIS. If you want to use uh, the GIS module, do you have access to the coordinates already? Or, um, Nicholas, is there a place where people can search for coordinates? Yeah, in our uh, GIS assignment, we have a few websites that we suggest people to go to um, to find some open source uh, coordinates for countries and their and their regions. Great. Um, so that's a good place to get started if you don't have any. Okay, so this uh, unit's pretty straightforward, and mm -hmm. you can just reference the assignments if you want to understand a little more what we mean by levels or hierarchy. Uh -huh. um, so after you've kind of talked about your organization units and you might have to assign some people on your team to do some follow-up. The bulk of the work is going to be what are you collecting? What are your data elements? Mm. Um, so things like are they standard or do they change is an important thing to talk about with your team. Right. Um, how are they disaggregated? So we've got an assignment here that helps you to break down, you know, are you describing this data by using categories or options? Um, so those things are, are very important to sort out before you do your configuration. Some other things related to um, the reports and the forms that you're using. So in DHIS2, forms can also be called uh, grouped together in data sets. So it's smart to start thinking about your data elements in these groups. So say you have form A, you know, it includes eight different data elements, then you might want to call it form A and you can group it like that in your Excel mm -hmm. just to keep things organized. Um, once you have things set up, you'll need to choose a period for your data. So it's good to now know and understand how often are we collecting or do we need these uh, reports. Mm -hmm. um, an indicator list is also important to bring in here. Um, so there's an assignment that helps you to sort out um, data elements and indicators. But you're also talking in this case about collecting the indicators that you know you need to report on for your um, for your uh, for internally or for sponsors or funders or anything like that, right? Absolutely. Hmm. And uh, it's important here to consider that DHIS2 language and terminology indicators in DHIS2 mean like it's a formula. It's based on something. So an indicator in DHIS2 might just be one data element that you're collecting, mm -hmm. or an indicator might be a formula that's a, a few different data elements, you know, added together or the average of a few. So keep in your mind that your program indicators might be a little bit different than how DHIS2 um, classifies an indicator. Right. But the first thing is to really understand what you need. And then going through the rest of the assignments, we'll learn about how those translate. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. So for users and user roles, um, it's it's pretty easy at the beginning when you're talking with your team to figure out who should be using it. But you may need to do a little investigation if you've got, you know, different field teams in different locations just to find their names, their emails, and if they're going to be using a mobile phone, um, that's important to have. Now, users are added to the system at the end. 
once we've you know configured it and set it up so this is something that you may not need right away but it's good to start building the list and to just have it in your excel file as we're going through um, an estimated number of users is helpful as well because depending on you know if you have a, a thousand users um, you might need to identify to your host or who's hosting your, your instance um, that there'll be a lot more volume of users right okay so when it comes to data input this is all about the forms right what forms are you using and how is your data being collected so it's good to know what you're doing now but also what do you want to be doing you know say you're using paper forms now and you want to move to a combination of paper and DHIS2 then we can uh, note that certain forms will be uh, arranged in a certain way so this is interesting as well how are your templates standardized for all countries are there some countries that are going to have a different form than others? Mm. Um, this is important because then we can create different forms for different users. And this also might be, instead of different countries, some, some uh, organizations might be small. You might have different forms mm. for different um, projects or different uh, funders, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or even a field office in one district might mm -hmm. be collecting different information because their Ministry of Health requires you know something different so cool. here it's good to discuss and to really look at your forms so if they're on paper or in Excel um, get them into one place some of the other questions are have to do with the features of DHIS2 that we're going to add later like does a form need to be locked so it cannot be edited or things like is there a deadline um, for which someone needs to put in the information and then the form becomes locked so different ways that you can manage um, your teams you know the timelines that you give them Languages is a big one as well. Hmm. Do some forms, um, will they all be in English? Are there different languages you're going to use? So right now DHIS2 is pretty flexible in that you can pick any variable. So whether it's the name of an option or the name of a form, and you can translate it to a different language. Um, the system has the interface in a variety of languages, but to set it up, you have to manually input translations for anything you want translated. So keep that in mind too as you're collecting. Right. So you can you can translate anything into different languages, but you have to select this should be X needs to be in this language, and then you have to type in what that is in that language. It won't yeah. translate it for you. Yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. Um, so the last question is about importing uh, past project data. So this is just to give you an idea when you're planning you know what we're, what we're going to achieve in the pilot does the pilot mean we need to import you know 5,000 forms from the past mm -hmm. or is that something that is maybe not necessary so this is definitely something to consider and depending what format your data is in you might need to you know get some help get some coaching because um, DHIS2 can bring in data from lots of different forms but it does uh, require, you know, a little bit of custom work depending what it is. So an important consideration. Of course, but it is useful when you have it all set up that you also have your your historical data that you can be reporting on, not just of course. from that start point. Yeah, and if you decide not to bring in historical data, you'll still want to have some dummy data or some test data, and maybe that is something that you're going to pull from the past anyways. Right. Um, as we go through and you get to the report designing phase, you want to actually have data to show. So whether or not you're using real or false, you'll want something in there. Good point. Yeah. So this section's kind of about, uh, will you need uh, to involve another piece of software or another like statistical program? Um, otherwise, if you can stick within um, the you know confines of DHIS2, um, this is just to explain a little more about how you want your data to be disaggregated or analyzed and then Rather than a question, it's let's collect all the reports together in one place because mm -hmm. as we start to move through, we're going to be constantly going back and forth to the reports to say, okay, does this form that I set up, is it going to meet the needs of this indicator on this report? So there'll be mm. kind of a little mapping that you'll want to do. Um, so this one's really just about getting your forms in one place and then confirming that the disaggregations that you said in the first section um, are, are true and are correct. So would this be a good place to, um, I know that when earlier on when we were working, we, we like to create some some mock uh, charts in PowerPoint, for example, or in mm -hmm. Excel. Uh, would this be a good time to do that, to kind of create a mock ch uh, graph or a table and say, this is what we want it to look like, um, just so that you have something that we're, you're working towards? 
Yeah, I think so. If your organization doesn't already have a good report that you could use, then by all means, uh, we like using PowerPoint just because it's pretty quick or Excel, the chart mm -hmm. maker, just to have uh, something to shoot for. Um, it's better than, you know, keeping it all in your head and then just trying to create it within DHIS2. It's nice to have a template to work from. So that's a, that's a great idea. Right. And then you can start seeing you know, what you have versus what you want. And you can actually, it's a great opportunity to move away from what you have towards what you want when you're doing this with mm -hmm. DHIS2. Mm -hmm. So a little more on report types and on um, output. So mm -hmm. there's some standard options like you can download reports in these formats. Um, and, and a whack of other ways that you can get your data out. So here it's just really being clear on what your program needs are. Right. How often do you need certain reports? How are you planning to share them? So as you may know, DHIS2, you can download them, you can put them on dashboards and give people a login, mm -hmm. or you can create a web portal, which is like a public and open page, but only people with the link can see it. So mm. that's another way you can share reports. Um, that's again continued in this question here. Cool. This is a good one. Do you require reports in different languages? So in this case, you'd want to make sure as you're doing the manual translations that Nicholas was mentioning earlier, you just include it for the reporting name that you would see. Right. Mm -hmm. So we don't have too many questions on this um, section right now, and I'm sure we'll add more in the future, but for system management and maintenance, it's good just to get talking with your team about who's going to be like the key point person, who's our system administrator? You know, who's someone who's going to be reporting um, any hosting or server problems to our host? Who's the person who might be managing our user roles? Um, so really thinking and identifying, if you don't know, then this is a good opportunity before you start configuring to scope it out, because this is for sustainability, right? You're going to need to have that core team and backups for that team. Right, right. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. I mean, this is a, an incredibly uh, in-depth uh, questionnaire, or question form that we have in the notebook as, as we're looking at here. And of course, at the mm -hmm. beginning, you said, yeah, there you go. There's the Word document that uh, is also available in the notebook. And, and I think the Word document's also on GitHub by itself. Is that right? Um, I'll post it. Great. Yep, so you can yeah. access it separately. So by the time you're hearing this, it'll be also <laughs> available on GitHub. And uh, what's really great, as you were seeing in the notebook at least, is that a lot of these questions that you might have uh, come up with while we're talking about this stuff, we reference those assignments that go into more detail about how would you answer that? How would you think about it? What knowledge do you need within DHIS2 to be able to answer that uh, if you don't have a coach that's handy necessarily? Hopefully those assignments will give you a little bit uh, and also point you in the direction of the right readings uh, so that you can get a little bit more of an understanding to be able to answer these questions on your own. Um, but I think that was a great start, Sarah. Thanks so much for walking us through. And uh, I, think, I think we're good for now. Great. Thanks. That's all for now. As always, you can get in touch with us at info at logicaloutcomes.net or on our YouTube channel, Logical Outcomes, or on github.com slash logicaloutcomes. Thanks so much.